Today we're going to talk to Ann Waters about her basketball career, her very successful basketball career, her titles, but also about what she's doing right now. She's uh, doing uh, webinars, keynotes, and she can teach something to you. Ann Waters, it's very good to see you here and that you took the time to talk to us about your basketball career, your plans for the future, and more specifically that you're willing to give us some insight in your webinars you're doing, and you will be doing more of them in the future. But first of all, Ann, how are you? How are you doing in those <laughs> corona times when we have to stay in our bubble, limit our contacts? Exactly. Well, thank you for having me. Um, to be honest, I'm doing good. Um, I think during Corona times, there's a lot of things that are happening in the world and it's a pandemic. I think we've never really uh, experienced something like that. And at the same time, I do feel very grateful. Uh, grateful that I have my family here, that everybody is healthy, um, that I can still do what I love to do. And um, our kids are, are going to school. Um, we spend a lot of time together now. Eh? There's a lot of less uh, social activities going on. So I think the first uh, thing that I want to say, I, I'm, I'm pretty grateful. And I do realize that it's not for everybody that easy. Um, in a way, we are privileged eh? to, to have a house, uh, to have some space. Um, and uh, also knowing at this time it's not easy for, for a lot of people. So um, I think we're trying to do also uh, some good things uh, for, for other people because um, those times are hard, uh, that's for sure. Um, at the same time, I think uh, two weeks ago, I did play again a little bit of basketball yes. with the Belgian Cats and that felt great too. It was good to be back with the team. Uh, it was great to be back on the court and um, of course yeah also to get our um, third consecutive uh, european championship ticket that of course uh, we always want results we are an ambitious team and that was important too but especially also the the atmosphere that was around it um, and it felt just great yeah to, to have again that competition yes because many players couldn't play a game only had uh, practices and now they could play a game and it felt good yes you felt really that um I would say maybe especially the younger um, uh, athletes, they, they are very hungry. They, they <laughs> just need that competition. Eh? They've been practicing since March, uh, to be really honest. And they, a, lo a lot of them they, who played only in Belgium, they only had two games in, in that whole period. That's a long, long time. For me, of course, it's a different story. Um, and I do want to explain it maybe quickly. Um, my story, of course, um, like a lot of people know, I would have retired at the Olympics past summer, but of course Corona came um, in between and it's still my goal, of course, uh, to go to those Olympics. I think we, um, we worked really hard as a team to get that um, ticket to qualify us for the first time in the history of, of Belgian basketball. And um, it is still a dream of me. I, I have to be honest, I think of, for all athletes, um, being able to go to the Olympics, I think it's something very special. Even though I just turned 40, uh, I know it's a big, big challenge for me uh, physically. Of course, it's getting a little bit tougher, um, especially my knees. Uh, they, they've suffered <laughs> for quite some time. Um, but at the same time, I think we have um, a good coaching staff, um, a good medical staff, and we have a very open communication and especially with the head coach, Philippe Mestach. Um, we kind of made a special program for me, an individual uh, program. Yes, because you're not with a club right exactly. now. Exactly, so I'm not playing for any uh, club team, but I'm kind of um, making my program like it would be for an individual athlete. We're just um, like three times, let's say, in a year that they have to peak. And normally, of course, basketball players, we have to play every week. We have yeah. to be consistent. It's yeah, that's a very different. different story. And I know that right now I, I can't uh, play everyday basketball anymore on those knees. I can't play weekly uh, games on it. So we kind of made the schedule that it's still possible for me to be as fit as possible uh, the, for this summer. Are uh, you 100% sure that you will be part of the roster uh, of the Belgian cats that go to the Olympics? Uh, well, of course, it's always a decision of the coach. Uh, I'm just a player. Uh, I am the captain, though, so I, uh, I do have a good communication with, uh, with the head coach. But it's still um, like last year, who, who would have thought that it would be a pandemic? Uh, right now, I think we can't be sure of anything. Uh, but the goal is still uh, to be part of the team. And I think uh, the people know it, uh, the players also know it. And 
I think I, I still have um, yeah, an important value also to the team, maybe a little bit less on the court, but there is also, um, and we will talk about this uh, a lot more later on, um, it's also about a team sports and, and it's very, very important to have a good chemistry, uh, to work hard as a team. And I think I still have, have a pretty good role uh, and a crucial role in, in the Belgian Cats. And, um, and I look forward to it. Uh, so it, it's something that I still want to work for uh, every day. I still do my workouts, of course, every day. I do have a, a team of experts who uh, guide me, who give me um, instructions, who give me the programs, uh, how I have to practice uh, to be uh, as, as fit as possible. Yes, you're now in the twilight of your career. Can we go back to those first days? You were a player at Osiris Denderleeuw, but very soon the French powerhouse Valenciennes showed some interest in a big talent from Belgium, Anne Wouters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, how I, s I really see my career. Um, of course, I started it here in Belgium. Um, I had some great coaches, by the way, also who helped me to develop um, as a player. But everything went pretty fast for me. Um, I started pretty late playing basketball and then those six years when I was in high school, everything went pretty fast from playing in yes. Osiris and then going to uh, youth national teams to even senior national teams when I was only, I think, 16 or 17. So everything went really fast. And then after my high school, um, I think I already had a little bit of strong character. I had to convince my parents um, that I wanted to do something with that basketball. I, I felt, okay, I'm 1 meter 95. Eh? I saw not a lot of women have that mm -hmm. height. But I did feel that um, it was something where I belonged. Uh, and, and it was more than just a hobby at that time. I felt that ah, this can be really like a big passion. Mm -hmm. I was never really already thinking about this can be my profession, um, but quickly uh, it showed up that I could make money with it and yeah. it could become my profession. Uh, so I had to convince my parents because they were very keen on getting a degree. It was very important for them. And there was really not an example in front of me that was already playing professional basketball. And so a lot of things happened pretty quickly. So I went to, when I was, I still had to turn 18, I went to Valenciennes, not knowing that it was already a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. So in a way, at some times you also have to be lucky. And I was lucky to uh, fall into a professional team that was playing for the titles right away, that was playing EuroLeague. Uh, so that I didn't know. Um, so uh, when I came there, I, I kind of see it as my... Um, student time, I would say. Uh, people here in Belgium, they will relate. They Sometimes they go to another city and they yeah. go and they stay there. They go in Opkot. Uh, yeah. But I kind of see it that that was a time for me where I really developed, of course, as a player, um, but also as a person uh, from a teenager becoming a young adult. And then um, quickly, uh, the United States came knocking on the door and yes. in 2000, um, I got drafted uh, number one. Yes, and, and maybe, maybe we have to explain this because yeah. not everyone realizes this, how, how big this is. It's, it's huge to, to get elected as, as the first um, number overall pick, LeBron James and um, <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal, Tim Duncan, they're all number one overall pick. So it's really something, something big to get elected by the Cleveland Rockers yes. as, the, as the number one. Yeah, when I think about it, and there are some images, I have to say, I was so young, I was so naive, I didn't know anything. Uh, I know that they, they kind of dropped me in a studio in Brussels, uh, Canal Plus, I think, <laughs> and then I was in direct connection with the United States. I got a t-shirt with WNBA on, and I was already so happy that I got a t-shirt, and it was <laughs> like WNBA on, and I'm like, oh my God, my night is already good. And then, okay, it, it comes through that I'm elected the number one. And I'm like, oh, I was so surprised. And I was like, not prepared at all. <laughs> um, People didn't prepare you for that? No, nothing. <laughs> I was really there, like, oh, Cleveland. Then they asked me that I had to call right away with, with people of Cleveland. They're like, oh, so you know where Cleveland is? I'm like, no idea. <laughs> I, I was not prepared. Nobody prepared me, no. <laughs> uh, so. I think we can say that times have changed also. Oh, you were only 19. <laughs> and I was only 19. My English wasn't that, <laughs> that good. <laughs> uh, so um, a, a new world really opened because I was playing then two years in Valenciennes where I learned like to, to 
being a professional team. But the WMNA was a different, was really a different story. Um, when I left, I do remember that it was hard because it's always, um, we always think that everything goes easy. But I remember that when I had to leave from Brussels airport, that it was tough. Eh? I left by myself, yeah. um, 19, not knowing who was going to pick me up uh, in Cleveland, uh, just hoping that everything was going to be all right. And then, um, yeah, a new world opened for sure. It was the first time that it was uh, in an, an even more competitive world uh, where you have to really stand up uh, for yourself, um, maybe a little bit more individual. Yes. And uh, very strong. I, I, I felt that there was competition within the team because there were still players that had to make the team. And so I felt like a little overwhelmed in the beginning. And especially I was the number one pick, but the coaches and staff had prepared me and said like, we don't want to have like too much pressure on you. Uh, we drafted you because we know your potential for the future. So we're going to give you the time. But as so the number one pick, there are big expectations. There are big expectations, but they did explain me that, okay, you're yeah. only 19. Normally, all the college uh, yeah, students 22. that are, yeah, that yes. they are 22. So they give me some time. So I didn't feel that I had to perform right away. Yeah. No, I just had to integrate. That of was course. already the main thing for the first year. And of course, getting physically stronger. I think that was my weakest point at that time yeah. um, that uh, I had to play against players that were much more stronger, much more explosive than I. So I had to go in the weight room a lot of <laughs> hours. <laughs> and then during several seasons, you combined two competitions, the European competition during the season and then the Women NBA, which is a summer competition. How, how tough is that to, to combine two competitions? When one competition ends, yeah. the other one starts. Um, it's hard and in a way, you're young at that time, so you love to play basketball, you love to play games. So it's from going one to another. It was like, at least physically, it was okay, you can do it. Um, but I do remember uh, one time we uh, in Valenciennes, we just won the title uh, and it was a big celebration with the fans, with everything. And I got the phone call and I said like, listen, you have to leave tomorrow morning, your plane ticket is No ready. time to celebrate. Nothing. And <laughs> that was so tough because I remember that, um, that they had prepared a big, big celebration like a couple of days later and I couldn't be there. I, I was already on the plane. And I, I do remember that at, at those moments, it was so tough because you had to sacrifice, like um, celebrating with your team, with the fans, with the sponsors, uh, with everybody. And I was already then like flying to the States and, and starting a new season. So I do remember those times they were hard, like because you go from one, like a high, like in a, in a big adrenaline, and then you go back to a team that is just started the season that is in preparation mode and where it's like completely different. So those times that I do remember, it's not easy, like mentally to switch yeah. off <laughs> the bottom and, and just go boom in another team. But at the same time, it has um, it taught me also to to adapt fast, to adapt fast to uh, different situations, different environments, different teams. So in a way, I think uh, I, I don't regret it at all because um, I just love to play basketball and, and I could do it at the highest level. Yes, you were very good at it because you were talking about those titles with Valenciennes. It's not only the French title, you also won the Euro League which is the highest, num it's the number one European competition three times with Van uh, and Two times, uh, yes. Two times, and 2001 was your first time? Yeah. You were 21 at that time. How do you look back on your first EuroLeague title? You were elected MVP of the Final Four as well. Yeah, like that was a special one because um, the year before we lost <laughs> the final uh, of that Final Four of the EuroLeague. And I do remember that was the first time I was devastated, but really devastated, like um, with, with tears, with disappointment, with sadness, with so much. And um, but it also, again, it had taught me so much uh, from that last final. And it was in the last second, like the worst way how you can uh, lose a final. And I think that next year we were all like so motivated. We yeah. Not that we wanted revenge, a little bit, yes, because in that last final was against Bourges also, and another French team are, are really our rivals. Mm -hmm. And we would work 
so hard. I do remember that time. Our practices were much harder than our games. We were so competitive also in Valenciennes. Um, we had a physical trainer that made us run outside in the winter. If it's snow, raining, it didn't matter. But so looking back, you really needed that lost final. Ah, uh, in a way, <laughs> yes, because uh, that's also something I do talk about a lot in my uh, webinars or in my keynotes. You learn so much also about uh, when you fail. And fail to me is, is first attempt in learning. And, a, and fail is not the opposite of success, it is part of success. And we do talk a lot about our successes, but not too much about when we really, yeah, we didn't make it, when we felt really bad, but that just makes us uh, more successful. I'm really convinced of that. Yeah, we will talk a, a little bit more about your successes. Yeah. <laughs> Back in those days, you were a guarantee for success. You won the EuroLeague title with Valenciennes in 2004, you went to Samara in Russia and straight away you won the Euroleague uh, with Samara. Was it your, your performance, your accomplishment? Never, never only my <laughs> performance, no. It was uh, again, um, I was in a very good team. Uh, I was surrounded by a lot of other good players. Uh, we had an amazing talents with Russian players, with good American players, with some other European players. It was a great mix and Samara, when I left to Russia, it was again a whole new culture, a new experience, and I was kind of ready for it after six years in Valenciennes, going to Russia. Um, it was an upcoming market. Um, they had some more budget, so they wanted to perform quickly. And uh, that's why they, they, came, they came along. And they also, of course, they, they offered me, a, especially financially wise, a much better offer than they could here in, in, in Valenciennes. So I was like, okay, it's time for something yes. new, it's time for a new experience. And of course, then when we won right away, again, that uh, EuroLeague, it was, it was amazing. But um, definitely not only my accomplishment, not at all. Uh, it was a team accomplishment mm -hmm. again. We need to go a bit quicker now through your <laughs> career. After the titles in Samara, you also had the, won the Russian title in Yekaterinburg. And then in 2012, you had a great season in Valencia, in yes. Spain, where you won also the national title and the EuroLeague title. Yeah, again, a very a nice experience, especially because um, that one is, is um, after I became mom and uh, I had the pregnancy and the challenge of coming back uh, to the highest level after being pregnant. Um, that was for me very, very special also to share that EuroLeague title for the first time with my kids, even though they were still babies. It was a special, very special moment for me. And again, in Valencia, it was not only, of course, my accomplishment. We had an unbelievable good team with probably maybe the most talented team I've played on. Okay. And, um, but it's still very challenging uh, to make everything work and to have a great team. So the talent was there, that's for sure. But I think we found a way also to really connect on the court and uh, yeah, to, to win that uh, EuroLeague. Yeah, and it's amazing. You won the EuroLeague in three different countries. Yeah. Um, so, but the combination with women and me, we talked about that and it made it difficult for you to be available in summertime for, for the Belgian Cats. But then um, in 2017, you were part of the team that won the bronze medal in in Prague. Yeah. Uh, is that one of the best memories of your career? Yeah, and I know it's very cliche, but playing for your national team, it's still very different than to play uh, for a club team. And um, about that national team, I think early in my career we were playing, I played two European championships in 2003, 2007. Um, we were always very close also to qualify for the Olympics. So that's a dream that has been <laughs> going on mm -hmm. for quite some time. But it was always, um, just not enough and um, that feeling I really had with the national team there was potential there was talent but it was just never like enough and then of course the whole system changed uh, the qualification windows um, they were played during the season yes. so not only uh, in the summertime so we didn't have to make uh, the choices between qualification tournaments or WNBA and that time uh, Philippe Mestach I, he was my coach in Castors Brain so he kind of re-invited me in the team and he said, come, we have like such a good young potentials. A great in, generation. In that team with, of course, our Emma Meesman. Um, but he said, they still need some experience. Like, uh, like why not? And uh, of 
because of all that, I think the kids are, my kids also were growing a little bit older. Uh, I had again a little bit more time and especially it was like during the season. So I was like, yeah, why not? Like I will play. And um, I do remember the first time when I went back, I felt right away, yeah, this is a team where there's so much potential, so much potential. So uh, we started to play. And from the beginning, I do remember uh, our games in Namur, where we had to qualify for the European Championship. Yeah, you could feel something special going on. A good chemistry. Very good chemistry. And uh, of course, also with learnings, and we mm. can talk about that later. But it's, uh, I, I did feel like, yeah, this is something I, I do want to invest myself again in. And uh, I want to go there with like 100%. And so when we arrived at our European Championship, of course, we were the underdog. And to be honest, we still like that role, the underdog. So that was kind of the most amazing uh, tournament ever because we were growing in that tournament. We had some close games in our groups uh, phase and we were just building our um, confidence, our enthusiasm, and, and it was contagious. And we kept growing, 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 and we go home with a bronze medal. Yeah. That was really, really amazing. That was amazing. And you were not the underdog anymore in February, just yeah. before a few weeks before the corona pandemic yeah. <laughs> in Ostend, where the Belgian cats clinched their spot for the Olympics. The first time a, a Belgian women um, basketball team uh, clinched, clinched the spot for, for the Olympic Games. Yeah, another very <laughs> special moment, because if you see the evolution that we made, it's quite amazing. And um, even more, even going further than that, of course, for us, and I hope the Olympics will go through and we can all enjoy uh, that experience. But it, it goes even further than that, because I think we can inspire a whole generation and seeing that, yes, a basketball team can qualify for the Olympics. I hope and I see it with my kids that they talk about it, they see it and it's that important also well, in a way to have role models and in another way that it's, it's much more visible, of course, uh, to see the games on TV, that people know who the Belgian cats are. So that is even uh, a further accomplishment, I think, that, that we, we have. Yes, and the Olympics are, of course, very special. Um, but then a few weeks, only a few weeks after the qualification, there was, I think, a huge setback when the decision was made that the Olympic Games in Tokyo were postponed for one year. Yes, um, and I remember at that time I was very disappointed um, because we didn't really understand yet what coronavirus really meant. And, um, but quickly, of course, we understood that it was impossible just to organize a mass event in 2020. Uh, so, um, and I also got infected with the coronavirus, so I was at the same time really sick and I had no energy. So then quickly I was like, yeah, it's just postponed. So it's not um, uh, cancelled. Yeah. It, it's a big difference. So it was moment or, or cancelling. So we were very uh, eager, of course, again, to start preparing, even though it's not easy because it's a long time again. But um, in another way, I think everybody is trying their hearts and, and the best they can. And I think, to be honest, that we will see Olympics next year. Um, we don't know yet in which formats and we don't know yet if they will be public or not. We really hope so, but in the same way, like we really, we can work uh, again towards our goal. So we went as quickly as possible <laughs> through your career. What do you take back from your career about what have you learned about the challenges in, in life? And what is the link with, with the webinars you are, you are talking about? Yeah. Well, especially um, when I was, uh, let's say, more uh, in my 20s, I was playing, playing, playing basketball, basketball. But I think maybe um, a key point for me was becoming a mom, I think. And uh, then you do have uh, also other responsibilities in life. And you kind of can take um, a step back also and, uh, and overlook a little bit. And I think um, my second part of my career I think it, it was even nicer than my first part. Maybe I had more success uh, on the courts in, in the first uh, part, but in the second part, I started to realize what it really meant. Uh, playing in a team, um, achieving goals together, sometimes not achieving goals together, how are we gonna work together as a team? And like, I think I, I've started to realize much more than 
uh, then I can I can score with a, a basketball, but I've also actually learned other things playing basketball. And that was kind of a transition phase also to understand like, okay, um, it's more than, than just playing a game what we are doing. Yeah, and we're talking about the team aspect. Basketball is a team sport. A company is also a team. What are the differences or, or c can you, yes, is it different in sports than it is in, in, in the business world, you think? Well, I think there, there are a lot of parallels and there are some differences, definitely, uh, with the sports world and the corporate world. Um, parallels, uh, I think in almost all the companies uh, I've seen now or I've visited, in some kind of way, everybody has to work in a team. And that's what we have to do on the court. And I think what I try to do in my webinars is really uh, show the links, the parallels that there, there are to, between the sports world and the corporate world. Um, and therefore, I think the sports world is, is very thankful because we, we can use um, really concrete things and people understand it right away. But the thing or the, the psychology behind it is exactly the same for a company. So that's the things I think I, I try to show them. Yeah. How we work as a team, uh, what kind of um, pillars that are really important, I think, in a team is, for example, um, trust, confidence, uh, trusting each other. In a company, it's exactly the same. If you're only thinking about yourself, about your own results, and not about the team or the company's results, yeah. I think it's, it's at the end, it's not going to be uh, successful. How, and then I try to, to really have concrete examples how we do it in, in, uh, in our teams. Because it's easy to say, well, you have to have confidence or you have to trust each other, and, but it doesn't work like that. So how do we do that? So um, those things I, I really try to uh, focus on in my keynotes and, and the webinars. the corporate world can really learn something about the exactly. uh, sports and world. For example, I think another uh, thing that I really sh always emphasize in sports worlds, we are used to getting a lot of feedback. Um, in basketball, we have timeouts. The coaches, they give us right away feedback while we are still playing on the court. We also, of course, have the game analysis through video, through um, team talks or whatever. But I think in sometimes um, uh, in corporate worlds, we are so busy sh um, with the operational stuff that we do not take time uh, yeah. to really give feedback sometimes and even a little bit more to, to give feed forward. Uh, very important also, like I think we, uh, and that those are the key things that we can take from the sports world. That's something that we are used to from when we we're little in, in sports. Yeah. Uh, we talk about the game that is coming up. So it's feed forward already. We, we're going to analyze that game. But we're also going to take some time back and, and analyze again how the game went. Yes. So those things. And I think uh, a lot of times it's, it's not easy, of course, to find the time. But if you do it like in a very concrete way and very specific, the um, advantages you will f uh, find in your, in your company will be huge. Yeah, we're talking about the feedback given by the coach. Being coachable is, is a term in, in basketball. Can uh, doing exactly what, what what the coach wants you to do, um, can you transfer that to personal life? Definitely, I think uh, being coachable, and we also talk a lot about leadership. Uh, there's a lot of programs about leadership. Those are, are the fancy words, but again, in sports terms, um, you have to of course follow some uh, the lines of of your coach of the coaching staff, and yeah, that's that's where you have to be coachable. But in a way, you also have to show your leadership. And those two, for me, they're not opposite again. They go together because you can be a, a very good leader, but also be being very coachable. And uh, those things are, are, are very important in teams, in different kind of teams, because you still have to always have your own identity. Yeah, you can't be too coachable yeah. and just accept everything what, is, what are people saying. Yeah. And the coach also has to give you some uh, creativity, some freedom, yeah. and in a way also to, to show your leadership, of course, on the court, off the court. But that balance, finding the balance between also being coachable uh, is, is that important and to me only the, the really the best players they can do both yeah and which other topics are you discussing in those webinars um well especially um a lot of times i talk about team uh, team aspects and the team dynamics um how to become a successful team 
Uh, you have some ingredients that you need, of course, to, to get uh, there. But then what are the next steps? Uh, how can you as a company also become a successful team? And then I take like the concrete examples because those are, I'm not there to, to have like a very uh, theoretical um, uh, summary, but it's, it's, I think for me, uh, important that I show uh, the concrete examples that we use in the sports world mm -hmm. and that how can we transfer that to the corporate world. Yeah. So the key points are, of course, uh, a building a team is about trust, but it's also about um, taking responsibilities uh, to being accountable for it. And uh, especially always like being team um, result oriented instead of your own ego and instead of thinking only about your own uh, results or own success. Yeah, that's a team aspect, probably the most important aspect in, in the sports. But there's also that relationship with your body and the, the rehab after an injury, coming back, uh, going to practice every day. Um, is that also something you, you're talking about during those webinars? Because exactly. you had your injuries, yeah. like all sportsmen uh, with such a long career, um, yeah, coming back a, after an injury? There is another uh, topic that I really uh, like to talk about, and that's resilience. I know it's also, again, a, a word, a fancy word we use all the time now, being resilient. But it's something, again, that we have as athletes, as sports people, you have to be resilient. And of course, it goes about when you're like injured and you have a huge setback. But it's actually like almost on a daily basis, you have to be resilient. You have to make the right choices every single day and that is something i think we again can learn from uh, from athletes from sports people and can you learn to become resilient is that something yes, you can learn yes i i am convinced of it that you're not born resilient it's not like i have a baby and now he's <laughs> going to grow to be a resilient yeah. person no it's something that you definitely can learn and um, you can practice and that's key also um, being resilient is also taking care of yourself in the first place uh, taking care of yourself in many different ways and it's not just one guideline that everybody can use because every person is different also but it's it starts with taking care of yourself and that's being resilient also let's talk about the work life balance it's something i think we all struggle with um, during your career you also had to make those choices am i going to sign a big contract here in russia or no i want to become a mother now first that's my priority yeah. first or um, signing with a big team or signing with a family friendly team. Um, those choices, are you talking about that too during those webinars? Yes, uh, I think in the in DT, the work life uh, balance or flow kind of, we, we uh, prefer to call it, is, is very um, a hot topic right now, especially during those, uh, those uh, Corona crisis. Um, I think a lot of people have to work at home and um, there is no more uh, balance between yeah. work, uh, work no, all, and uh, life. Mingled. Everything is the same. Yeah. So we see a lot of people that are struggling with it because before you had to go to your work or you take your, your bike or you drive to your work and then you close the door, you come back home and work is done. Mostly, not for everybody. But nowadays uh, it's a, a new challenge, of course. And um, to find that balance, I think, again, you have to understand that to me, everything is connected. Uh, your body, your mind, uh, your professional way is, is really, um, really connected. And how can we, all those little balls, how we have to p keep them in the air? That, yes. That's the biggest challenge, of course, because uh, you have a professional life, you have a private life, you'd like to do some sports to stay active, to have an active lifestyle. You have your social life, um, maybe you're a parent. There's a lot, a lot of different roles that come on our shoulders. And it's not, of course, uh, I experience it too. It's not always easy to, to find the right balance. And, uh, but the first thing again is already uh, being aware of it. <laughs> yeah. That's already the first step. And during my career, I had of course the same issues, the same things. And um, I had to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, I don't know how many uh, weddings or birthdays mm. or uh, other big celebrations I've missed because I just, I wasn't here. And uh, those things, of course, you understand it, but if you really want to do something and you you go for it. But in another way, you also have to find that balance. And maybe by having a family, when I was yeah in my mid-career, let's say, it gave me, it really, really gave me that balance because I could go, 
do my job on the court and I had the most wonderful job, I understand that, but um, I could come back home to a family who was always there for me, um, where I had a completely different role, uh, where I was uh, just a mom and, and taking my responsibilities there also. So that balance was key for me. Athletes need to be at their best when they have to play a game. They need to peak at certain moments. Is that something you can pass on to other people, you think? I think so, yes, because um, what we see uh, with athletes that they peak sometimes. They're not always at their best. And I think sometimes in, in uh, some companies in the corporate world, we always want to be at our best. And it's just not possible because it's, uh, it all goes back to the fundamentals and it's energy management. Uh, it goes about um, sleep, it goes over, uh, about nutrition, about exercise, uh, your social support system, even respiration. If those fundamentals are good, then you can perform. But you cannot, day on a daily basis, be at your no. best and peak all the time. And that's another thing I think we can learn from uh, athletes. Uh, our recovery process is almost as important as our practice time. And for athletes, it's well known that they can rest, that it's important to sleep, but why isn't it that important for people in companies, in corporate worlds? There, I think we still have to change our mindset where uh, it's kind of cool and fancy when you only need five hours of sleep. It's not good. It's not good for your body. Now, a lot of studies have showed it that it's, that it's so important to have your eight hours sleep. For athletes, it's already known that it's, it's really um, uh, efficient for them. But I think for all people, and those and are the you things... You need that rest to perform better. Exactly. Yeah. But also, uh, I think um, when you go to your job, you also have to perform. You also have to be at your best. So you also have to have your recovery time. So those things um, also, I think, are very important and that we can learn from athletes. Focus is another thing. In basketball, you need to focus before a game, focus during the game, focus at the free throw line. You cannot be distracted by the crowds, by, um, by the fans, but by the refs. Yeah. Um, is that also something um, in business? Yeah, I think it's another transferable thing. Um, as athletes, as sports people, we always like the word win. But for me, win, it's another, again, something, it means something else. It's what's important now. It's something, again, where athletes are pretty good at because we do focus at this moment. I'm on the court, I'm focusing what I have to do right now. And you can um, go as far as you want. It's like you make a great action, but you miss your layup. You can't stay in that moment where you're like, ah, oh, I missed that layup. No, you have to yeah. go on to the next moment. Mm -hmm. You have to move on and you have to focus again. No, now my task is uh, to get the ball back in defense and boom. And that's how you can always go from one moment to the other. And a lot of times, of course, in, in life, um, are we stuck in the past? Are we thinking too much about the future? But if you really focus on what's going on right now, I think uh, you will have better results also. And I think you'll have a, uh, maybe even more happy life. But you do learn from uh, failures. You do learn from the past. In the introduction, we talked about your successes, the EuroLeague titles, the bronze medal with the Cats. But you lost some finals as well. Definitely. I think um, that's all the keynotes, all the webinars, I think I start with this kind of introduction um, because, of course, I, I'm very happy with the, the titles that I've won, the championships, the cups, and they are very important. But, and there is a big but, um, I'm also kind of proud of the finals that I've lost. And it's kind of weird to say that, but failure is to me part of the success. And because of those lost finals, I'm sure I've won other ones because I had much more time to think about what I could have done better, uh, what the team could have done better, and it's, it was definitely a, a self-reflection time. To me, fail is first attempt in learning. And I think we talk a lot, of a lot of times about our successes, but not as much about our failures. And those make us also, uh, those uh, failures make us as people. Um, how are we going to deal with that failure? I think it's very important, and especially as an athlete, uh, there is just no athlete that didn't fail. We fail all the time. And I think there's a nice quote, of course, about uh, Michael Jordan or um, 
it's it's because of those failures that he he has won that yeah. much also. So I think it's something we can definitely learn. And in business wise, it's exactly the same. Uh, there are going to be great deals you got to achieve, and there are some deals that you didn't get. But you also have to learn from the ones you didn't get, maybe to get even a better deal. You have now arrived um, in your career at the point where it's difficult for you to compete with the young guns on a physical level. Is that something you, you see in companies too, where people are on different paces, uh, working on different paces? Uh, young employees, older employees do ha who have more experience? Exactly. I think on the work floor you always see different ge generations who have to work together. And again, I think that's why uh, the Belgian Cats are a very nice example. Uh, there are many different generations, of course, working together towards the goal. And I think that's also the beauty of it. I think it's, uh, we have that kind of chemistry where I feel energized by the young uh, players. And I do think that the young players could still learn a lot uh, from me, from my experience. Uh, sometimes I'm there to calm them down or to, uh, to be um, kind of when there is a stress situation, uh, to be there to say like, it's going to be all right, say, uh, just take a deep breath and we're yeah. going to be okay. Uh, and on the other side, I also learned from them. So I think on the work floor, it's exactly the same. Of course, uh, the employees with a lot of uh, miles on their uh, records, or they, they have uh, so much experience, so the, the young employees can learn from them. But the other way around too, I think the older ones with much more experience, they also can learn uh, some uh, something from the from the young generation. Okay, we're now at the end of the interview. Thank you so much. We learned a great deal, and we wish you all the success with the Belgian Cats at the Olympics and uh, a lot of success in your f future career. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. <laughs>